notes. This morning, we're in part five of a series we're doing, which is our theme for this year, Decrease for Increase. We know that John the Baptist said in John 3 verse 30, he must increase, but I must decrease. So we're looking into our lives, into our ministries, into our marriages, into our businesses, wherever we need to look. And we want to look at the areas that God highlights so that we can decrease the distractions and the limitations, and we can increase our effectiveness for God. And so we can become everything God wants us to be this year. We've been doing a 21-day of fasting, which will end on Wednesday night, the 29th. And during that time frame, we're meeting every Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. You're so welcome to come and join us. It's actually been incredible. It's been refreshing. It's been life-changing. And so you can come along and join us. We've been worshiping, teaching the Word a bit, praying. And so we've done... Two parts of Decrease for Increase on the Wednesday nights, and they are on the website if you haven't been able to join us. This morning, we want to talk about having ears to hear, having ears to hear. And in Mark 4 verse 9, we looked at the parable of the sower last week, but let's have a look at verse 9 here because Jesus makes quite an important statement here in verse 9. He says this, and he said to them, he who has ears to hear... Let him hear. I want you to know today as believers, listening needs to be active. In other words, listening is an intentional decision. It's an intentional attitude that we develop. And so let's be sensitive so that we can catch what God is revealing in our spirits to us so that we can act on it and so that we can develop and grow. Uh, It was quite interesting this week, I was just uh, busy preparing my notes and just going over some things, and one of the guys in the church sent me a little picture, and uh, it's this one that they're going to put up now, and uh, isn't it amazing when you put two ears next to each other, that that, that actually, I know it looks weird, eh? Uh, but it actually forms the shape of a heart, and isn't it interesting that the middle of the word heart you find the word ear. And so, I want to say this to you this morning, the ear is the way to someone's heart. If you want to build great relationships, learn to listen. If you want to grow in your relationship with God, if you want to be bright, vibrant in your spiritual walk with God, then guess what? You've got to learn to listen to Him. And so we want to talk this morning about the importance of having an ear that hears. In Psalm 143 verse 10, the psalmist writes this incredible verse in the Amplified. He says, teach me to do your will, for you are my God. Listen to this. Let your good spirit lead me into level country and into the land of uprightness. How can God lead us? To level country. What he was saying is, Lord, lead me to a place where my feet don't stumble. Lead me to a place where my walk is consistent and solid and strong. And how does that happen? How does God lead us into righteousness? We've got to learn to follow. And the only way you can follow someone is to listen to them and to watch them. Can you say amen? So firstly, I want to say this to you, and it's so important that you catch this this morning. The first step to listening and hearing what the Spirit of God is saying to you in your spirit is you've got to recognize this morning that you and I are complete in Christ. Would you look at the person next to you and say, you are complete. Very often in churches, the word is preached from a basis of inadequacy. And so people, how many know we all know our inadequacies? But if we focus on our inadequacies, it's going to steal our faith and limit our ability to hear what the Spirit of God is saying. You are completing Christ. Your spirit has been regenerated. Can you say amen? You are alive to God this morning. If you are born again, you're alive to God and you are able to hear and to respond to the love of God. Can you say amen? If you're not born again this morning, today you will get that opportunity. You see, Colossians 2 verse 10 says this, and you are complete in him who is the head of all principalities and powers. 
So the word of God is saying to us today, we are adequate to hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying. We are able to live from the place of strength. We're not trying to get strong. We are strong. Can you say amen? We are ready and we are able because our hearts are turned towards God. Now last week, we established this very important uh, principle of fact. We established for there to be a harvest, and remember we looked at it, 30, 60, and even 100 fold. So there is a process, there is progression, there is development in the kingdom of God. But for a harvest to be present, there were four things, four very important things that need to be present in our souls. Or we could say it like this, in the soil of our heart. Can you remember what they were? They were number one, a listening ear. In other words, that's our hearing. Number two, we said this, there needs to be a healthy thought life. That speaks about our thinking. Number four, we said there needs to be life-giving words coming out of our mouth. And that is your talk. That is your speech. What are you saying with your mouth? Because everything you say carries power. And we're going to look at that very specifically next week. And number four, we said there needs to be intentional action. Faith without works is dead. Faith without action is dead. Now listen to this. Intentional action this morning, if you think about it, actually translates to vision. Because how many of you know, hope speaks about vision. And faith gives your vision. Faith gives your hope substance. And so we're going to look at some of these areas this morning because how many of you know all of us want to have vision in our lives? All of us need hope in our lives. And the word hope in the Bible isn't just to hope something happens. The word hope is actually a very powerful term. The word hope is an expectation. Hope actually translates to vision. It's something in front of you that you are expecting for God to do in your life. It's holding the promises and the word of God in front of you. Now, everyone wants to have vision. But the reality is this. In today's society, how many of you know anyone can have a goal? You don't have to be born again to have a goal. You don't have to be born again to set a strategy for your life. As a matter of fact, there's been a lot of teaching over the last 10 years that speak about having goals and setting goals for your life and being intentional about things. And so there's nothing wrong with that. But I want you to know vision speaks specifically about a dream, about a revelation, about something that God has deposited in our hearts and he's placed it there and it speaks about purpose. It speaks about something that is in there that you cannot get away with. The truth is this, if you even look at unsaved people that have connected with their purpose or connected with their vision, and that vision, even if they're unsaved, God placed it in there before the foundation of the earth. If they somehow connect with that, you'll see their lives are successful. You'll see their lives are fulfilled. Why? Because they're following the intent of their heart. And so it's so important this morning that we recognize the reason sometimes we struggle to have vision in our lives is because we don't hear what the Spirit of God is saying. We're not sensitive to the things that the Spirit of God has deposited in our hearts for us. And you know, when you are not sensitive to the vision that God has placed, and you're not inwardly sensitive, then I want you to know the only way your vision can come to pass this morning is through faith. Faith activates your vision. Faith ignites your vision. And how many of you know what the Bible says in Romans 10, 17? Faith cometh by hearing. And hearing by the word of God. So we need to realize this morning, when Jesus made this statement... Let him who has ears to hear, let him hear. He was making an incredibly powerful statement to his disciples and to us. So let's talk about how can we fine tune our listening? How can we stay consistent in this area and develop the heart and the attitude that we have hearing ears? A listening ear allows the word of God to be sown into our hearts 
that starts to cause the word of God to come alive. It produces faith that starts to grow. And then listen to this. When I begin to speak my vision, it starts to come to pass. So this is the thing I started to realize. Sometimes we are speaking the word because we've been taught to speak it. Amen? And there's nothing wrong with it. But if you're just speaking the word for the sake of speaking the word, and you haven't heard what the Spirit of God has deposited into your heart for your life, for your purpose, those words do not have anything to connect with. They're not specific. They're not intentional. And guess what? Your vision is therefore blurred. So this week we're going to talk about hearing. Next week we're going to talk about speaking. And the following week we're going to talk about vision. Because they all come together when we start to hear properly. All through the Bible, our attention is continually drawn back to the importance of how we're listening. So would you just grab the person's ear next to you? No, don't do that. (laughs) Grab your own ear and just say, listen intently. So... We read verse 9. Remember that, Mark 4. Now have a look at a couple of verses later. Mark 4, verse 12. Jesus makes the same statement, but he adds a dimension to it. He says in verse 12, So that seeing they may see and not perceive, and hearing they may hear and not understand. So he adds a further dimension, and he connects seeing and hearing. He connects the two, and that confirms what we're saying here about the words we speak and having a vision. So seeing, if you want to write this down, seeing is for perception. In other words, seeing speaks about perceiving and seeing vision and dreams. It's it's an inward thing that happens. But hearing this morning is about understanding what God is saying. And you're going to see this morning how important this is as we dig into the teaching. Understanding speaks about interpreting correctly and knowing how and what to do with what God has shown me. We were speaking with a brother this week who said he saw something, God gave him a scripture, and so he went and did it, and it hasn't worked. Yeah, because what we didn't do is we didn't take time to listen What is the Spirit of God saying? What is the understanding that God wants me to get? So what? So that I can apply this and I know what to do. Because it's all about timing when it comes to God. Can you say amen? It's getting the timing right. So, three times in this parable, Jesus speaks about how we listen. Have a look again for me at Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4, verse 24 to 25. Look what it says. Then he said to them, Take heed, listen carefully, take heed what you hear, for with the same measure you use, it will be measured back to you, and to you who hear, more will be given. Verse 25, for whoever has to him, more will be given, but whoever does not have even what he has will be taken away. Did you see what that verse just told us? Do you want to increase in 2020? Do you want to see God's word working more than it did the year before? Then guess what? You've got to increase the measure you're using to hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying. Because it's clear here, if you don't increase the measure, the measure you use is the measure it will be measured back to you. That word measure in the Greek is this. It's a vessel used for receiving and determining the quantity of something. So look at something very powerful this morning. You determine the measure that comes back to you by the measure that you use. If you're going to use a teaspoon to measure out your hearing, guess what's going to come back? Teaspoons. If you decide to use a dessert spoon in measuring how you hear, guess what's going to come back to you? You're going to get dessert spoons back. If you decide to use... Oh, awesome. If you decide to use a soup ladle to measure your hearing, guess what? You'll get 
soup ladles back. If you decide to use a pot to measure your hearing, guess what? You will get pots. How many know? You decide to use a wheelbarrow to measure. Guess what? You'll get wheelbarrows back. So look at the person next to you. Say, what measure are you using? You see, many sit today and they say, no, I'm trusting God for more and I want this to happen and I'm believing God for that. Okay, that's awesome. I'm with you on that. God wants you to have that. But what measure are you using? Because if you're using a dessert spoon, ma'am, sir, you're not going to get a wheelbarrow back. So God doesn't determine the measure that comes back to who determines it. You and I do. How? By the measure we use to hear what the Lord's saying. Isn't that powerful this morning? So how many of you are going to use your wheelbarrow? That's awesome. I'm glad. We'll get some wheelbarrows for next week. Where is welcome today? Can I ask you to drive your bucky in here? Because I know what I'm going to use to measure. Who's got a big track for me? (laughs) But here's the scary thing. Look what it says in this last part of this verse. It says, for whoever does not have what? Does not have what? Hearing ears. Even what they have heard will be taken away. Have you seen someone, and we've probably all been there on different levels, that that their their walk with God goes backwards? You know what happened? They stopped hearing. They stopped measuring the word back into their lives, and so there's no harvest there. And when there's no harvest there, guess what happens? Even what you have gets taken away. And it's not a negative thing in the sense that God removes it from you. It's a principle. A spiritual principle, a law that functions. That's why we read last week, what does the enemy do? He comes immediately to what? To steal that word. Why? So it can't produce a harvest in our lives. So let's dig a little deeper here. Let's let's take a look at a couple of incredible examples of this working in someone's life. Can you turn with me to 1 Samuel 3 verse 19? Are you getting some help this morning? Look at the person next to you say, this is awesome this morning. Thank you for that encouragement. Praise the Lord. 1 Samuel 3, look at verse 19. I want to show you the end of the example, just so that you can catch this, and then we'll kind of work backwards, and we'll look at why Samuel got to this place. In 1 Samuel 3, verse 19, it says this. So Samuel grew. Please say grew. And the Lord was with him. Say with him. And look what happened. And the Lord was with him, and let none of his words fall to the ground. Think about this. Think about if you literally walked out here today and everything you said came to pass. Anybody up for that one? I know some of you men are smiling because you know exactly what you'd say to your wives. (laughs) You see, you're like, I see a full roast for lunch today. I see myself playing golf in Hawaii. I see our building paid off and expanded to a thousand seater. Think about it. Imagine if everything you said from today came to pass. That's what the scripture is saying. Everything Samuel said, God performed. Now let's go back into his life and have a look what happened that put Samuel in a place that God literally, hear what I'm saying, God literally followed him around and every time he spoke, he made sure it happened. Here's the key. The Bible says Samuel grew sensitive and positioned himself in God's presence to hear the Lord And therefore, his words carried weight. Let me give you a negative example, if I can, just quickly. Jump into Ezekiel, keep your place there, and have a look at verses 1 to 3. Ezekiel is busy speaking speaking against God's prophets. 
And look what he says in verse 1. And the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, prophesy against the prophets of Israel who prophesy and say to those who prophesy out of their own heart. Please underline that. How do they prophesy? Out of their own heart. Hear the word of the Lord, they say. Thus says the Lord God, Woe to you foolish prophets who follow their own spirit and they have seen nothing. Now go read Ezekiel, we don't have time this morning, but verse 7, he goes on and he says this, Have you not seen a futile vision, and have you not spoken false divination? You say, the Lord says, but I haven't spoken. Now, Ezekiel, specifically speaking to prophets and leadership here in this context, and so I'm not getting on you, but this is what I want to say to you. There's a principle here that we need to guard against just speaking things out of our spirit that we haven't heard the Lord say. And if we want to have a vision that God brings to pass, then we need to ensure that that vision has been deposited there by God, by the Holy Spirit, that I'm following the purpose and the intent of my life that God has for me, because guess what? Then God will bring it to pass. Then God will be with me. Then God will be working towards having that happen to me. That's why we always say this. Don't just step out and start a church, start a business, do something. Hear from God. Get clarity, get direction from God, get confirmation. Because if he doesn't send you, he doesn't have to pay for you. Amen? I know this is a serious teaching, but can you just smile, someone? (laughs) All right, let's jump back to Samuel. 1 Samuel chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. And we look at the life of Samuel right from the beginning and start to look at the pattern and we're probably going to learn some things that I think can help us this morning. In verse 1, it says this, Now the boy Samuel ministered to the Lord before Eli. And the word of the Lord was rare in those days. Please look at verse 2. The word of the Lord was rare in those days and there was no widespread revelation. Please notice something here, incredibly powerful. Samuel was already doing something with his life. He had already connected himself with God. Notice something here. The Bible says he was ministering to the Lord. Look where he was ministering to the Lord. Before Eli. You know how he was ministering to the Lord? He was serving in the local church. If you go study that, he wasn't standing worshipping God. He was serving Eli in the house of God, in the temple. He was being mentored, and they say he was ministering to the Lord. Don't take your service before God as as something light. It is your worship before God. It is your service before God. You are ministering to the Lord. Now, that includes your worship. I'm I'm not diminishing that. That includes our worship. But notice, he was ministering to the Lord, serving in the temple or the local church. Notice something else. He was in submission to authority. He was in the local church, in the temple. He was under a pastor or a leader who was the lead priest at that time. And if you go read the story, we'll look at it just now, you'll see something amazing. God was about to judge priest Eli and bring Samuel and put him in the position as the priest. But Samuel wasn't even there yet. He was busy ministering. He was busy serving. He was busy developing. Notice something else very important. There was no vision in those days. If you go read it in the King James where it says the word of God was rare and there was no no widespread revelation, it says this, there was no vision in the land. Why? Because the priests weren't speaking and declaring the word that God had given them. And listen to this, the people were not responding in faith to the things God wanted them to be busy with. And so the vision had been diminished. Hear this this morning, no vision, no clarity of mind and purpose. No vision, there's nothing for the people to respond to or activate their faith on. That's why we need to be hearing from the Lord. Let's read on in the story. Are you getting some help this morning? Are you glad you came to church? Give them the person next to you a high five. Say, you look awesome this morning. 1 Samuel 3, let's have a look at verse 3 and we'll read on in the story. And it came to pass at that time while Elah was lying down in his place 
And when his eyes had begun to grow so dim that he could not see, and before the lamp of God went out in the tabernacle of the Lord, where the ark of God was, and while Samuel was lying down, that the Lord called Samuel, and he answered, Here I am. Now who called, who called Samuel? The Lord called him. Look how Samuel responds. Samuel says, Here I am. He got up, ran to Eli, and said, Here I am. You called me. Confirmation that Samuel identified his service and worship to God, not as worshiping God, but as serving the man of God, or the vision of God, or the plan of God. That was his first response. What does Eli want? Now have a look. Let's read on. And then Eli said to him, I did not call you. Go lie down again. And he went and lay down. And then the Lord called yet again, Samuel. So Samuel arose and he went to Eli and he said, here I am, for you called me. And Eli answered, I did not call you, my son, lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, nor was the word of the Lord yet revealed to him. So Samuel was in a process of developing and growing in his sensitivity. He was learning to hear the difference between Eli's voice and the Lord's voice. How many of you know we've all got to go through that process? Is there anyone here today been serving God a while, you stepped out and did something you thought the Lord told you to and it wasn't? I hope there's just one other person. What is that? You don't have to feel guilty about that. That's the way you learn and grow. Don't, don't diss that. Learn from it. Learn from it. Grow from it. Samuel did not yet know the voice of the Lord. And so the Lord was not yet revealed to him, but God was fixing to do something amazing. And the Lord called Samuel again a third time. Say a third time. Look at the person next to you. Say, is this guy deaf? A third time. So he arose and went to Eli the third time and said, here I am, for you did call me. Then Eli perceived. Say perceived. Remember we spoke earlier about perception, seeing, and hearing. Eli perceived that the Lord had called the boy. Now, there's, there's quite a lot we can learn from this portion, but firstly, let's have a look at this. The reality, if you look at the context of this story and you understand the story behind it and the story in front of it, you'll very accurately be able to say, symbolically in these verses, God is busy with a transition. All right? And what is that transition? Eli had served God very faithfully, but he'd been disobedient in a couple of specific areas. And because of that, his children had been disobedient. He hadn't corrected them. And so they now were disqualified from fulfilling what God wanted them to fulfill. And God was busy preparing Samuel. They were in transition. How many of you know we've been saying this here that the ch this church is in? Transition. God is busy fixing to take us out of something we've been doing into something we need to be doing. All right? So there's a transition moment here. Now listen carefully. Whenever there's a transition, there has to be clear instruction, new vision, and proper leadership for that transition to be successful. If God is doing a new thing, there needs to be fresh leadership, there needs to be new vision, and so that there's the right perspective. We have to understand what is it that the Lord wants us to be doing in this new thing. Because how I many otherwise, I mean, there are a lot of things I'd love to do. <laughs> there are some things that I even think in my heart would be great things to do. But is that what the Lord wants us to do? So as, as, as the lead pastors, it's our responsibility to get vision for the church. But how you know, it's the elders and the leaders and all of us as a congregation that need to witness. And so new leadership doesn't, new leadership doesn't mean God's moving someone out to move someone in. New leadership can just be fresh leadership, new perspective, dynamic perspective that says, guys, this is where we've been going, but this is where we're going. Come on, bump the person next to you. Say, this is good preaching. So learning to hear clearly in transition is vital for success in 2020, in 2021. What is the Spirit of the Lord saying to me? And, and guys, this can apply to any and every area of our lives. It can apply to our marriage, 
to our children, to our finances, to the way we run our businesses, to the way we work. You know, God can just make little mid-course adjustments in our heart and our attitude, and it can break something out that can turn a marriage around, turn a business around, turn a situation around. And we mustn't be scared to follow the promptings and the leadership of the Holy Spirit in the Word of God. Can you say amen? When you hear something, now here's, here's, the, here's the catch here. When you hear something, be patient. Ponder it. Meditate on it. Focus on it. But remember this. Stay obedient to what the Lord already showed you you should be doing. In other words, listen, there's, a, there's something else here that's not in this verse, but we see it through the life of Samuel. It's called faithfulness. Do you know that God's not, God's not flaky? Anybody agree? God's not flaky. Have you ever been with people, and, and there's no one in this church, um, this was in the other church we were in long ago. Have you ever heard someone come to you and say, you know, the Lord's telling me to do this? You know, the Lord showed me to do this, and you're like, okay, great, go for it. And they go do that, and then two months later they come back, they say, you know what, I, I feel the Lord's showing me another direction. So, okay, so is God confused? He didn't give you direction the first time? Or you didn't hear properly, and now he's changed? And how you know, it's never... It's never, you know what, Pastor, actually I missed God. I shouldn't have done that. I don't think the Lord was speaking to me. It's always the Lord's changing direction. It's like the Lord is so confused about our lives. He doesn't know where we should be going. No. God wants you to be faithful. Have a, have a go with me quickly to Matthew 24, uh, Matthew 25. <clears throat> There's another place in Scripture where Jesus speaks the same kind of word in a different parable, and it's in verse 29 of Matthew 25. Look what he says. For to everyone who has, more will be given, and he will have abundance. But from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away. Now, how you know, he's not talking about when he says, to him who does not have, he's not talking about physical possessions. He's talking about, this is the parable of the talents. He's talking about the person who does not have faithfulness. He's talking about the person who does not have a sensitivity to the stewardship that God has placed over their lives to do certain things. So here's what I want to say to you. Always be faithful to keep doing what God already showed you to be doing. Because it's from that basis that you qualify to be promoted to the next thing. That God wants you to do. You know, when, when I was working for Ramus South in Johannesburg, I was on staff there for 16 years. When, when I got to the end of that season and God was fixing to send us down here to plant this church, you know what happened? I was basically out of a job. <laughs> I had done everything God had told me to do. I had six pastors under me. I literally didn't have to go to work because I'd handed everything over. What had happened? A season came to the end because of faithfulness, because of dedication, because of obedience. Now what? God could release the next thing. And you know that scripture later on says, he who is faithful with little will be faithful with much. Look at the person next to you and say, stay faithful. Faithful to your marriage, faithful to your children, faithful to the job God's given you, faithful to the things God's got you busy with in church or in ministry, wherever it is. And you know what? It's from that basis God will promote you. Now, I know all of us get excited. I mean, I would love God just to suddenly come and say, ah, Larry, we're moving you to Hawaii. We've got a big church there for you to go. And you know, in your mind, sometimes you can get excited about something new. But that doesn't mean it's God. So learn to listen. Are you getting some help this morning? All right, let's move on. We're nearly there this morning. Let's jump into verse 9. 1 Samuel 3 verse 9. It says, Therefore Eli said to Samuel. Now remember the preceding verse? It says, Samuel perceived. Now, here's, here's just a little thing. Isn't it amazing? Samuel, uh, Eli, sorry, Eli perceived. Eli, who was schooled leader of the temple, took three times as well to realize that God was speaking to Samuel. So even when, we, even when we've been serving God a long time, sometimes we don't always hear the first time. And that's, that's important for us to realize today because we're all human. We all have fallibility. So therefore, 
Eli said to Samuel, go lie down and it shall be if he calls that you must say, listen to this, speak, Lord, for your servant hears. Would you say that with me? Speak, Lord, for your servant hears. Let's say that again. Speak, Lord, for your servant hears. One more time. Speak, Lord, for your servant hears. You see, right at the start of his ministry, Eli talks to taught Samuel one of the most incredible, valuable lessons. When you think God is talking to you, say this. Speak, Lord, your servant hears. Your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. Now the Lord came and stood and called as at other times. Now remember, this is the fourth time that the Lord is coming to speak to Samuel. And Samuel responds. He answers, what does he say? Speak, for your servant hears. And then the Lord said to Samuel, Behold, I will do something in Israel at which both ears of everyone who hears it will tingle. So here's a few things quickly from this part of the story. Number one, what did Eli tell Samuel to do when he realized God was speaking to him? Did he say to him, you better run around, God has been speaking to you, you're in big trouble? This is the third time? No, what did he say? Go lie down. Go lie down. Go do what you were doing before. Go lie down, and if you hear the voice again, respond. Lord, speak. Your servant hears. So here's the thing. When things aren't happening, when you're not hearing clearly, when you feel the Lord wants to say something, don't panic. Don't run around trying to fix things. What must you do? Lie down. What is that spiritually speaking about? Rest. Rest. Because when... You're working, God rests. But when you rest, God is working. So we've got to be in a position of rest if we want to hear clearly the voice of the Holy Spirit. If we want to hear with hearing ears, we need to learn to rest. The next thing is, isn't it amazing? God's grace. Eli didn't even catch that the Lord's trying to speak to Samuel. Samuel hadn't got it yet. He was still growing. But how many of you know God was gracious? The fourth time he came, Samuel finally responds. And isn't that how the Lord works with us? We don't always get it the first time. We don't always get it the second time. We don't always get it the third time. But how many of you know the Lord will keep coming? He'll keep coming with his encouragement. He'll keep coming with his whisper. He'll keep coming to speak to us. Why? Because he loves us. He's committed to us. Then the next thing we learn from this, the word lie is symbolic of a position we need to adopt, which is rest. But that rest speaks of a person who is waiting. Waiting on the Lord is pivotal to hearing properly. How many remember the life of Abraham or Abram? God comes and gives him a promise. And what does he say to Abram? He says to Abram, I'm going to make you the father of many nations and you will have a child. And how you know the story goes on 25 years later, nothing's happened. And guess what happens? Sarai, Abraham's wife, comes to him and says, listen, God's not doing much. Let's make this happen. And she comes up with, for me, for a wife, is quite an unusual suggestion. It's like, why don't you sleep with the lady who works for us? I mean, think about it. So what happened? Abraham takes her advice. Who was he listening to? The wrong voice. (laughs) You think? (laughs) So Abraham decided and Sarah decided, listen, we're going to help God fulfill his promise. And guess who's born? Ishmael. Ishmael is still around today. You've got to feed him. You've got to look after him. You've got to take care of him. And it becomes a burden in the flesh. So when you're hearing God, wait for clarification. Wait for direction. Get vision. I've I've discovered this. When God speaks, normally after he's spoken, it gets worse. (laughs) It's like you go into a darkness and it's like, when is this going to happen? You stay faithful. You stay in a place of rest. You stay connected to the things God's got you connected. And you know what? He will come and he'll show you the timing. I say it like this. Keep following and keep pursuing Jesus daily. And he will lead you into the pathway of righteousness. Can you say amen? Amen.
the worship team's going to come. Let's turn to Philippians chapter 3 as we close this morning. Philippians 3 and verse 8. Look what it says in verse 8. Of Philippians chapter 3. He says this. Yet indeed, I also count all things, say all things, loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Jesus Christ my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and I count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ. Jesus loves you this morning. Jesus is your Lord. And you know, I discovered in my own life that sometimes we struggle in our naturalness to hear God. And sometimes it's because we have these deep feelings of inadequacy. We feel like we've failed. We feel like we're not good enough. And I want to say to you this morning, because of that, we have a lack of confidence sometimes in ourselves. But I want to say to you today, you know, God created you with amazing potential. You are not limited this morning. You are complete in Christ. So don't limit yourself. If you'll start to trust God this morning, believe that you are in Christ and that you are complete. Believe this morning you can hear from God and you do hear from God. You know what? Listen to your heart. Respond to those inward promptings and those those sensing in the inward man. God is directing you. God is speaking to you. It's time to arise and walk into your increase this year. You will fulfill your destiny because God has a great life for you. Whatever you're walking out of today, you're walking out and you're walking into the best that God has for you in 2020. Would you say this with me? Say, I can hear the voice of God. Come on, one more time, let's say it. Say, I can hear the voice of God. In John 10 verse 3, it says this, To him the doorkeeper opens and the sheep hear his voice. And he calls his own sheep by name and he leads them out. And when he brings them out, his own sheep, he goes before them. In other words, he leads them. And the sheep follow him. Why? For they know his voice. You know his voice this morning. Say this with me. Say, I am hearing the voice of God for my life. Every head bowed, every eye closed, no one looking around. God is saying to all of us today, I have increase on my mind for you this year. Remember in 2020, all things are possible with God. Can you say amen? Every head bowed, every eye closed. If you're here today, you've never been born again. You've never made Jesus the Lord of your life. You've never been saved. You might know God. You might know of God. You might even... Believe in Jesus, but you personally have never prayed the sinner's prayer. You've never accepted Jesus into your heart as your Lord and Savior. I would love to pray with you today. It would be privileged this Sunday to lead you in the prayer of salvation. Maybe you hear today you once served God, but things happened over the years and you've walked away, you've backslidden, you're not in fellowship with God, you're not serving Him anymore. But today you're here. You're here because... You heard the voice of God drawing you back. And today you can rededicate your life. And number three, maybe you're here today, you are born again. You are serving God, but you want a deeper walk. You want to experience God on a new level. And so you want to be baptized in the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in tongues. If that's you this morning, in either one of those three categories, on the count of three, if you'll lift your hand, we'll know we need to pray for you. And we would love to do that this morning. One, two, three, raise your hand. If you want to be born again, you want to rededicate your life, or you want to be filled with the Holy Ghost, would you just lift your hand wherever you are, so that I know I need to pray for you this morning. Is there someone today, you want to give your life to Christ, you want to rededicate your life, or you want to be baptized in the Holy Ghost, we'd love to pray for you. Father, I thank you therefore for the word that's been sown into our hearts, that it will not return void, but will accomplish that which you please. And we thank you for that word today. In Jesus' name, everyone agreed, said? Amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank you so much. This-